Can we just put our hands together and give the Lord a great praise today for that peace, that peace that passes all understanding. Praise the mighty name of Jesus. Well, you look so great today. Isn't this a beautiful day? It's just this, man, I walked outside this morning and I was like, where am I? And it, the, the cool breeze is blowing and we're just blessed, aren't we? Can we take just a moment and pray for our friends and fellow Americans and brothers and sisters in Puerto Rico today? Can we hold them up? We have one of our men in the church uh, who is over there right now, and we sent some money through him last week. We have another family that is going that has not heard from some of their family members. He's a, a two-time Afghanistan war veteran. And this brother who's an usher in the church and been with us for many years, we're gonna, gonna send him with a check. We were able to send 10,000 last week. By the way, in all the hurricane stuff, you have given now over $230,000. And we wanna say thank you. And uh, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna believe at the end of this day when this service is over, there's gonna be ushers standing at, at, the, at the doors. And if you'd like to help us help people in uh, Puerto Rico. I've been there, preached there many times, actually, through the years, actually, two, three or four times, I guess that's many. And, and uh, they're precious, precious people. And we want to send through this great man in our church. He's, he's got a church over there that we're familiar with that we're going to distribute food. They've already fed this past week over 600 families with the resources that you sent. And uh, let's, let's do it again. I mean, if you, uh, let's just do it again. And can we join hands and can we pray for a moment for these people? You know, how many of you remember the storm that came through here? I was at, we were at, without power at our house for about five days. And man, I felt like I didn't know what to do with myself. So we finally gave up and moved to a hotel. But what do you do if you can't run away? What if you do if you're on an island and there's nobody that can help you? The body of Christ can be a can be a blessing. Let's offer our prayers. We can do that. Lord, we pray for the people of Puerto Rico. We pray for our responders there, our military and our, our, all of the wonderful people who are working so hard. We pray for their safety. We pray for the help. We pray for the ingenuity, the ability to help the broken lives, restore their lives, restore them, help them and, and heal them, oh God, and raise that nation back up or that, that state back up for your glory and your, your will, we pray, Father. We cover them in prayer today in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, amen and amen. Would you turn to three or four people, smile at them, say, I was hoping you would get to sit by me today. I, I, I like you a lot. Go on, and, go on and get a good vibe going with them. Well, it's so good to see you here today. You guys look great. What a great, great day, right? And I want to talk to you. You can open your Bible anywhere you want to. It doesn't matter. I'm going to preach out of it. And I'll hit where you're at before the service is over. But I don't have a particular scripture. But we are beginning today a brand new series um, from the book that I wrote several years ago that's being uh, released again. The publisher called and said that they had had a great response and it was one of our best-selling books. And they said, could we, could we do an update on it? And you put a couple chapters in addition to it and, and we want to release it again. <laughs> and so they're doing that and it'll be in bookstores and so on. So I thought, you know, so many new people, and even those of you who are not new, you can't remember half the stuff I teach you anyhow. That's amazing. When I preach something I've preached before, people come up, I have never heard. And I want to say, yeah, you have. I preached it about a year ago. You just weren't, just weren't listening. But, but, uh, but, you know, the Word of God is good anytime we hear it. I want to talk to you about the right people, the right place, the right plan. And I want you to receive because I do, I do believe that I have faith for what I'm preaching, that there can be impartation. More than a service, more than a sermon, there can be impartation into your life today. That's really what I feel. So I'm going to share what's on my heart. It is so critical to get the right voices in your life because if you don't get the right voices, you will not make the right choices. If you don't 
If you don't understand and make the right connections in life, you will not reach the right destinations. And everything is connected. You've got to have the right people if you're going to have God's blessing upon your life. Because God uses people. Nobody has ever received a check signed Jehovah Jireh. He used somebody. I know God's your source, but He used somebody. God's not running car businesses. He's not running banks and loaning money. He's not, he's not, uh, you know, he's not having employment agencies. God has people who are doing that, and those people can have a major impact and influence on your life. All great things flow through relationships. And we need, we need to pray for those power relationships in our life. A power relationship is God blessing you for transition. When when God wants to transition you from one place to another place, He will put in your life what I call kingdom connections or power relationships. People many times who have done what you're trying to do, already been through what you're going through, and they have the ability to reach back and grab you and pull you through and expedite your journey in amazing ways. And it's all about who you get around. Something else about the right people, they, have, they can unlock the potential that is inside of you. If you get around the right people, they can unlock the potential that God has put in you. Some people, you know have the opposite effect. They kill your dream. They, they, they will cause you to abort the purpose and the plan and the, and the thing that God has put in your heart to do. But there are other people, like when Mary got around Elizabeth, the Bible said that John the Baptist, the baby, was in her womb, and he started leaping. There are some people that will cause you to abort the baby you're supposed to give birth to, spiritually speaking. And there's other people, if you get around the right people, they'll make that baby leap. They'll make that dream say, yes, I can do it because God's told me, and that's just a, and they're feeding that part of you. And so that's why it's so critical to get the right people in your life. Somebody is already on the level that you're trying to get to. And one kingdom connection, one power relationship can change everything. That's why I think it's so important that every day of our life we get up and we pray for 2020 discernment in the Spirit. That we understand that when God wants to bless you, He will send a person. And when the devil wants to curse you, He will send a person. But either way, it's going to be a person. And that's why you need that 2020 discernment to tell and discern the people who are supposed to be in your life. The Apostle Paul said in Romans 8, he said, No, no man after the flesh, but after the Spirit. What strange language. What do you mean, no, no man only by the flesh? He's saying that not only when you allow someone, in, when you allow someone into your life, not only do they bring their physical presence, but they bring a spirit. They bring a spirit. A person, there's a spirit about a person. And he says, don't just know people after the flesh, but know them after the spirit. And he, they that are after the Spirit do mind the things of the Spirit. And they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. Meaning this, there are flesh people. They're dominated by their flesh. The Bible said the carnal mind cannot discern the things of the Spirit. They are just carnal and they, and they will not give you good, uh, good advice. They will not give you spiritual counsel. They will not give you the voice of the Lord, the Word of the Lord. If you get around them, they will talk you out of your faith talk you out of the great call that God has for your life. They'll talk you out of everything grand and great that God would do. And that's why he said, no, don't just know people after the flesh because they're flesh people and they're spirit people. Flesh people, flesh people feed your fear, but spirit people feed your faith. Flesh people tear you down, but faith people build you up. Flesh people drain your energy they, they, they waste your time. They make you go around the mountain one more time. But spirit people make your baby leap, your dream leap. They speak to something inside of you that releases your potential and causes you to have great purpose and great calling on your life. I call these people kingdom connections, power relationships. For example, when 
Saul of Tarsus, needed a life change. God put into his life a man by the name of Ananias. Ananias was the right man in the right place at the right time. And God said, go lay your hands on that man. He's a chosen vessel. I know he doesn't look like it, but you are going to be the, the, the power relationship in his life that turns his life around. And Ananias went and laid hands on Paul, and your Bible said that the scales fell off of his eyes. All of us need somebody in our life that, 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 that when they pray and talk to us, we see things right. We start seeing things in the way that we ought to see them, not just like we're stubbornly seeing them. You're blessed when God brings into your life someone who can help you see right. The scales fell off of his eyes, and Saul of Tarsus became, by the power of God, the great Apostle Paul, who would go and do so many amazing things. When he wanted to start preaching, the Bible said that nobody in the church would allow him, would give him a chance to preach because they were terrified. He had persecuted Christians and killed them. And so the Bible said there was a man by the name of Barnabas. Again, a kingdom connection, a power relationship, the right man in the right place at the right time. And Barnabas had something in him. Watch now. He says, you know, I discern that God has his hand on you and even though you have no credibility in the church and nobody will open their pulpit to you, the great Apostle Paul, the man carrying around half the New Testament in his spirit, can't get an opportunity to preach in any church. But Barnabas, who, whose name, by the way, means son of reconciliation, Barnabas said to the churches, I want you to have him in, 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 on my behalf. I, I am setting up... And I'm telling you, I stand behind him, and I want you to trust me. He has no credibility, I do. He has no clout, I do. He has no influence, I do. And I'm using my influence, my clout, my credibility. I'm telling you, this man has something to say. And he opened the door like a bridge, became the opportunity that... Paul got to go where he could have never gone by himself because he had a power relationship, a kingdom connection, a man in his life who said, I'm going to open doors for you that you cannot open for yourself. Let me tell you when you get blessed, it's when you start believing and seeing that God has people who can knock the scales off of your eyes and God has people who can bridge you into circumstances and places that you could never get yourself. Your name is not known there. Nobody's ever heard of you. Nobody knew that Paul could preach like he could preach. But here comes this man and he says, I'll be a power relationship, a kingdom connection. And later, the Apostle Paul got so discouraged after going through tremendous warfare and trials that he said in 2 Corinthians 7, listen to this, I had fightings on the outside and I had fear on the inside. Have you ever had a day like that? fightings on the outside. There's so much stuff going on out here in the, in, in, on my job, in the family. This fighting's on the outside. And even worse than that is fear on the inside. Doubting my own ability. Doubting my own faith. Doubting my own mind. Doubting my own uh, talent. Do I, do I have what it takes? You, that's a bad day when the enemy's not just fighting you externally, but internally. Fighting on the outside fear on the inside, but listen to what God did to get him through this rough season where he was about to quit. He said, nevertheless, God sent Titus to me and he encouraged me in the work of the Lord. Isn't that amazing that God would use a little nobody, no, nothing guy that nobody's ever heard of, but Paul said, I want to tell you about Titus. He encouraged me. When I was about to give up, when I was about to quit, when I was about to throw in the towel, God gave me a power relationship of encouragement, and he encouraged me in the Lord. I'm telling you today that God has the right people. If you're discouraged, you just start looking. God will start sending people. If you don't know which direction to go, God can send 
convincing somebody to knock the scales off and it was there all the time, you just couldn't see it. And if you are in a situation and you can't get your foot in the door, you can't get in, it seems like you're blocked out and the doors are shut, God says, I've got for you those right people like Barnabas who can bridge you over and open doors that you cannot open for yourself. How many of you would like to have some kingdom connections, some power relationships in your life? I think about Ruth. Ruth was lonely. She was a widow. She was single. Does God care about the divorced? Does God care about the single person? Does God care about the widower? Does God care about people who are lonely? You better believe He cares. The same God who said, it's not good for man to be alone. Saw Ruth in her loneliest hour, and God said, I'm going to give her a man, and I'm not scraping him off the bottom of the barrel. I'm going to get him off of the top. She, she found a guy by the name of Boaz, or actually, he found her. She was out in the field, and Boaz was watching her. She had no idea he was watching her. Just look around you. Somebody's probably watching you. And God said, I know what you need. I know the right person. I know the right plan. I know the right place. I know how I've got a dating matchmaking service like you wouldn't believe. And if you just trust me, if you just quit bringing the wrong people in, as long as you got the wrong people, the right people are shut out. So wait on the Lord and put him first. And, 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 she, and, and Boaz is watching her, and suddenly he falls in love with her. And the Bible said that, that they ended up getting married. God had a plan for her life because He cares. If you're lonely, He cares. If you're single, He cares. If you're a widow, He cares. And He knows when things are right. And God knows how to bring the right person into your life. I wish I could shake the young people sometimes and say, you're forcing it, honey. You're forcing it. You're forcing it. Don't force it. Wait on the Lord. When it's right, it'll be right. When it's right, it'll be joy. When it's right, it'll be peace. When it's right, it'll be love. When it's right, they'll be full of the Holy Spirit. They'll love God just as much as you do. It won't be a struggle all the time. There will be the witness of two or three witnesses. you got to wait on the Lord and wait on His call and wait on His purpose. The right people. Somebody shout the right people. The right people. The right people. When I think of the right people, I think of Naaman and how that he had cancer. The cancer of that day, which would be leprosy. And what did God do? You know... Sometimes we miss those power relationships because we're looking for them in big shots and big name people. But he had a, Naaman was a famous general, but he had a maid in the kitchen. And she was just a maid, just washing dishes back there, cleaning the floors. But she had in her life a living God and a healing answer. And sometimes if you're not careful, you'll miss the kingdom connections and the power relationships. And it's not always with the, with the high and powerful people, but sometimes your power relationship can be with the person who's cutting your grass or the, or the person that's working in the back of the kitchen somewhere. People that you never dreamed God could use to speak to you in profound ways. And this maid says, I wish to God that you could get to the prophet that's over there because his God is living and his God heals. And if you could get over there, you could recover from your leprosy. And the Bible said that he went on that word. She was a power relationship. She was a nobody. And yet she was mighty in God's eyes. God uses people that other people don't even recognize. God raised her up and had her there. And that powerful general... That powerful general gets in the water at the instruction of the prophet and he ducks seven times into the water. And I told him in the first service, I'm going to get me a sermon called Seven Ducks in a Pond. Amen. Because, because when he ducked, one not, not the ducks that are floating, but when he ducked under the water seven times, God healed him of leprosy. 
And I'm telling you that God has somebody around you with a living God and a healing answer. And if you'll just listen, he'll send those people into your life. Right now, many of you are in a transition. Many of you don't understand the season that you're in. I'm telling you, God knows how to send the right people. There have been times in my life when I needed to hear from God and somebody that nobody had ever heard of. One time, Perry Stone and I were in Romania, and this woman comes up and through an interpreter, she had her, she had a, back they, they were very, very poor. Communism had just fallen. She had pitiful rags on. She had this thing because they cover their head over there when they go to church. And she was an old, old woman. And she looked at me and Perry, and we were just starting out in ministry. She was a, she was a mother, and she had a, a grandmother. She had, to, she looked like she was about 70 years old. But she began to point her finger, bent over, and she began to prophesy prophesied to Perry and prophesied to me. She told him through the interpreter, one day you'll be on television. Me too. One, one day you'll do this. One day you'll do this. Your ministry. We didn't have any of the resources. We were just trying to stay alive in the ministry. We were just hoping, can we get booked somewhere next week? But she told us, and, and Perry even patterned his whole ministry after what that woman told her. And, and I remember so. I can't remember. I can't remember what she told me, but it still happened. Do you understand what I'm saying? Just when you feel like giving up, God will send to Titus. You know what Titus means? You can make it. Can you believe that? His name means you can make it. God will send somebody who will say, you can make it. Don't you quit now. Don't you give up now. This is just a battle before the blessing. You can make it. Turn to somebody and say, my name is Titus, and I'm here to tell you, you can make it. Somebody clap your hands and praise the Lord. Hallelujah. That's a good word. Turn to somebody and say, no giving up, no quitting, no throwing in the towel. You can make it. Just being around the right people can make all the difference in the world. You sure don't want to get around some people when you got fighting on the outside and fear on the inside. They'll push you on off the cliff. <laughs> Hallelujah. Everybody say right people. Right. See, I believe that God wants to restore discernment to our lives for this reason. You listen to me. I heard the Lord drop this in my spirit this morning. I said, why? Why do I need to preach this here and now? He said, in my spirit, I heard the Lord say, because I'm about to send the right people, and I want them at full alert. What do you mean? What do you mean? I want them to get ready to receive. Because Luke 6, 35 said, Give, and it shall be given unto you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. But here's the part. Shall men. Shall men. Shall men. Everybody say, shall men. Shall men. But if you don't have discernment, you, they'll, that miracle can pass you by. Shall men give unto your bosom. God gives us kingdom connections in business, in our careers, in our ministries. Kingdom connections. Right people. And then secondly, and I'm just giving you the over, overlook for the next two weeks and please don't miss next Sunday. I'm going to talk about next Sunday some things I've never taught before, and I'm so excited about the right place because it's so critical. But I want to talk, just, just give you a little headliner right here. The right people. Everybody say the right people. But secondly, it's about the right place. God said to the prophet Elijah, a famine is coming. Go to the river Cherith. I've commanded the ravens to feed you there. Notice it's a specific place. If he had gone anywhere else, the ravens would not have fed him. If he had gone anywhere else, he would have starved to death. God said, my blessing is connected to a place. And I'm telling you, Elijah, I'm going to provide for you, but you've got to go there where the blessing is. Well, I can just go anywhere I want to and everything's going to work out. You're absolutely wrong. Had he gone anywhere else, the bird, the Bible said, brought 
in one call, meat, and in the other call, bread, every morning and every evening. Can you imagine? But if you're over here and God said the blessing is going to be over there, then the blessing will go over there and you'll sit here in tremendous need. But over there, if you go where you're, God has a there for you. A there is a place of provision. When you get in that place, God will provide. He'll use dirty birds. He'll use, don't think everybody who's going to bless you is going to be a Christian. The raven was an unclean bird, but God said, I'll use that little dirty bird. And he'll, you know why he was a dirty bird? Because I believe he was picking the bread. They're in a famine. Where is he getting meat and bread from every morning, every night? And only one rich enough to eat bread and meat is Ahab and Jezebel. They would put it on the table and the dirty bird would rip it up and take it and feed the prophet. You get in the right place, and God will make the devil bless you. He'll make dirty birds bless you. He'll make evil business people who thought they were going to cut you bless you. Oh, hallelujah. You can't curse what God has blessed. And when a man is in the place where he's supposed to be, the enemy cannot stop the blessing. And boy, I tell you, he just sits back, and every morning, every evening, the raven just just like UPS, just <laughs> drops it off right there into the frying pan. He says, thank you very much, Lord. I give you the praise. And he eats his steak and eats his bread and eats his steak and he's getting fatter and fatter. Everybody else is getting thinner and thinner, but he's just eating and eating because he's in the right place. But then the Bible said, and I, I could just see him in my mind just when he thinks, I have really got this down. I got my frying pan out. I got the fire built. And I'm just going to have to teach the body of Christ how this is done. How to get the birds to feed you and the river to flow in the middle of the famine. That's going to be my number one New York Times bestseller. And I'm going to put out a brand new teaching series on it. And just about the time that he thinks he's got it down, the Bible said the brook dried up and the bird quit flying. God was saying to him, when the brook grows dry, it's time to go back to your source. Your source is not the brook. Your source is not the bird. Your source is God. And if you're in relation, don't go to God for, what you, for a miracle. Go to God for a relationship. If you have a relationship with Him, then I got news for you. You'll have a miracle every day of your life. It's all connected to Him. Some of you don't get it. The only way you get the right people in the right place, it's connecting to Him. The Scripture said that God then changed directions. But see, if we're, if, if, if we're anchored to a memory, if we're tied to, to and, and anchored to a method and a memory of how it's always been, then many times the blessing moves on and we're still holding on to the old wineskins. The Bible said God won't put new wine in old wineskins. And when the brook dried up, God was saying, seek me. You're getting too dependent upon that source. I'm saying to many of you in transition that you think you got your life all mapped out. You think, I, I got the contract, and that's a big money contract, and boy, that's a big part of my salary, the commission, and just when you get to thinking that they're your source, and that's your, your security, because you play golf with them, and you politic with them, and you, you hobnob with them, and wine and dine them, sure enough, somebody comes in, undercuts you, and the brook dries up. What do you do then? You don't fall apart. You just say, now, Father, that person was never my source. You are my source. That company that laid me off is not my source. God is my source. Connect to Him. God said, move. He said, move from the brook. I've commanded the, the widow and go to Zarephath. I've commanded the widow there. Notice it. I've commanded the widow there to sustain you. Nowhere else. You got to be in the right place. You got to get where I want you to be. That's why we really, really need to be sensitive. 
that God is wanting us to understand that you've got to turn loose sometimes of the old way and the old method and the old memory and the old system because he's shifting things in your life. John 15, he said, if you abide in me, that's the key. I am the vine, you are the branches, and you will produce much fruit. But it's not connected to them, it's being connected to me. And I'll always make you fruitful. I don't care what the economy does. I'll have my hand on you, and I will bless you. How many of you know that God is your source, that, 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 that my God supplies all my needs, not my company, not my boss, not this one or that one, God? Come on and give him a praise. I'm going to hurry. I'm talking about, I'm talking about places of blessing. Places of blessings. Zarephath, Cherith, places of blessings. The Lord spoke to me in this and He said that notice in the story of Elijah and Elisha. Elijah, Elisha said, I want a double portion. Elijah said to him, if you're with me in the right place, at the right time, with the right person, when I go up, the mantle will fall and you'll get double portion. But it's dependent upon you being in the right place with the right people. And I'm the right person. I'm a power relationship, Elisha, in your life. And you can get offended at me. You can get mad at me. You can get hurt at me and leave, but you won't get where you're going five years from now. You'll still be sitting outside your destiny because you better learn to respect the power relationships that God puts in your life. And the Scripture said that as soon as He said, you want it? Be with me in the place where I am when I'm taken up. You'll get it. And the Bible said, I love this text. The Bible said, and Elisha, who was a farmer who made his living with a plow, he had seven, oat, uh, seven, um, seven um, yokes, <laughs> seven yokes of oxen. That means he had, he had hired hands. You can only do one of those at a time. And he had seven John Deere tractors. And, 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 and he was in the field plowing. And the Bible said something so powerful. Don't miss it. It said, Elijah, Elisha broke the plow. Did it on purpose. That plow was how his family for generations had provided. But sometimes when God's going to do something magnificent in your life, it will require of you to break the plow will say, I know this is your form of security. This is your form uh, 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 of, of self-blessing. This is what you've depended on. This is how God's always done it. But there is a double portion that is available when God tells you to break the plow. The plow may be your denomination. For me and Sharice, it was our denomination. We were in a different denomination when God called us to come to Free Chapel. And God said, respectfully, break the plow. In other words, if I, in order to be where I am today, I had to say, this has been amazing. It was amazing for my mother and my father. It was amazing for generations. But Lord, I hear you. I know I hear you. And some of you know what I'm talking about. Maybe it was a Baptist plow or a Pentecostal plow or a Methodist plow. I don't want, I don't want the blessing. I don't want to be anchored to a memory. I don't want to be anchored to, to, to what used to be powerful. And there's nothing wrong. God uses denominations. But for me at that season in my life, it required the breaking of the plow. Break away from that and step out on nothing but a word from God. And you can't go back to a broke plow. It's broke. There's nothing there. So it's do or die. Here I go. I've heard from God. That's the kind of move that God would bless. I wish somebody would praise God right there. I really feel this today. Break the plow. Step into the unknown. Break the plow. And the Scripture said that when he broke the plow, that quickly Elijah goes, and I love it, he's just moving on. He don't care if he follows him or not. See, power relationships are not on your convenience. Well, um, I might, if you ever get around somebody that's really great at something, don't, don't, and you ask for an appointment, 
and, and they go to opening up their day planner and I can see you for 20 minutes on June the 19th and at 3 o'clock at Starbucks. Don't, don't talk about, well, I got to cut my grass that day. That's the day I usually go get my hair done, so that won't work. No, you rearrange your schedule. And Elijah, Elijah act like he, he almost made it hard for the boy. He, he just said, I'm, I'm moving, and if you want it, you be with me, and if you don't want it, that's your deal. It's on you. That's why you can, I'm offended. I don't like him. I don't like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. You better get, get control of your soul. Get control of your emotions. Your emotions, you know, you get in a church and you get a real, real leader sometimes and just forget church. Just for, let's talk about your boss or somebody. They'll hurt your feelings. But the truth is, if you want what you want, you better stay connected to the power relationships God's put in your life. Get your little emotions out of, out of, out of under, get your soul under control. Go right back in there with a good attitude. You hurt my feelings, but I love you. That's, this is good preaching. I'm preaching better than y'all letting on right now. Because that man holds a lot. That woman holds a lot. So he follows him the first place they go. Real quick, I want to go through this and I'll close. Right place. Follows him to Bethel. Bethel is where God gave Jacob a vision of the house of God and he saw angels ascending and descending. If you want a double portion, if you want the right place, you've got to have the right appreciation for the house of God. And it tells me this, Bethel means house of God. God showed him angels ascending, descending. It tells me, and then Jacob made a powerful statement. He said, I have found the gate of heaven. Do you understand that your church is the gate of heaven for your life? Do you understand that God will do for you in a place and setting like this? The heavens are open and angels are descending while we're preaching and ascending and they're taking needs up and sending blessings down and it doesn't happen with you doing your own thing. When God assigns you to a house, it's a place of blessing. It is the gate of heaven and you don't need to treat it casually. You don't put other things ahead of it. It's the gate of heaven for your life. Angels notice if you're in church. Got proof of that. Read your Bible. Read the story of Jacob. Secondly, he's got an appreciation for the house of God now. Then he goes to a place called Gilgal. Gilgal was where Israel had to be recircumcised. Have you ever thought of circumcision and got a happy feeling about it? Notice that sometimes the place of blessing is a place of pain. That when God is going to do something, we don't always think that the place of blessing is a fun place, is an enjoyable place. Sometimes it will hurt to be in the place of blessing. You'll get your feelings hurt. You'll get your emotions hurt. You'll get your, you'll get your mind hurt. You'll want to give up and quit, but stay where God tells you and get a hold of your flesh and say, you know what? You're not going to talk me out of what I'm supposed to do. I'm going to, and God is, God is getting you ready see he gets you in love with his house he gets you dealing putting away with of the flesh dealing with the flesh that anger that bitterness that gossip you get you start little by little dying to that stuff then he takes him to Jericho and Jericho is where he saw a vision Joshua did for the city God gives you vision as as you're in the right place you get in the right place and God will begin to give you vision for your life Took him to certain places. And lastly, he takes him to Jordan. This is where the transition is going to happen. And Jordan speaks of death. The cross is not seeker sensitive. The cross is seeker deadly. And God is not trying to bless you all the time. I, uh, this is going to shock some of you. God is trying to kill you. He's trying his best to kill you, not physically, but kill the old nature. And let me tell you how you know you're dead. When they throw dirt on you and you don't feel it anymore, you're dead. 
So if people are throwing dirt on you and you're still getting all upset because they talked about you and hurt your feelings and about to cuss them out and quit and leave and all of that, you're not dead yet. You're not dead until they can throw dirt on you and you don't even feel it. You say, well, just whatever. I love that story of David. I love that story of David when that little pip squeak guy, uh, I'm trying to remember his name. He, he was a little, I, I, there's always somebody like this. David was in, down on, on his luck, and everything was going wrong, and, and, and he looked, seemed like a million miles. He was one chapter away from the throne, one chapter. But there was this little guy who followed him around. I think his name was Abimelech. And he followed him around with, with rocks and, and dirt clods, and he would beep, beep, and hit him, hit mighty David. And one of David's mighty men, I love it, you ought to read it. He turned to David and he said, if, I'm talking about brutal killers. He said, if you will let me hit him one time, I will not have to hit him again. Now, that's a Bible verse. Just let me hit him one time. And David said, no, leave him alone. Listen now, this is a man who's died. He died in that cave hiding from Saul. He died in the wilderness. He died to all of his ambitions and his flesh. And they're throwing dirt on him, but he doesn't feel it. He said, leave him alone. It may be that God will hear and see what he's doing and bless me even more. And the Bible said in that moment the heavens opened up and a fiery chariot of fire swooped down, picked Elijah up, and on the way up, Elijah throws the mantle down. And Elisha picks the mantle up. And Elijah started his ministry parting the water. Or ended his ministry parting the water. But Elisha started where he left off. Elisha poured water. And then he was able to part water. You'll never, you'll never part water until you learn how to pour water. And the Bible said that suddenly Elisha moved in a double portion. The right place. He was in the right place. The right people. Give me two minutes and I'll finish this sermon. The right plan. It's so critical to understand that one plan from God, one idea from God can change your life. God is an entrepreneur that wants to bless you. He can give you one idea. One idea from God is better than 10,000 philosophies of man. One idea can change your world. And anytime God is going to move, He will give you a plan. God is your source. God knows how to, to give you the plan for your life. He really does have a plan. He gave... He gave uh, Marconi, an idea, one, one idea, and today we have the radio. He gave Edison one idea, and today we have electricity. He gave Bill Gates one idea, and today we have the internet. He gave Steve Jobs one idea, and today we have the iPhones and all that is going on with that. He gave Betty Crocker, one idea, and we've been fighting the battle of the bulge ever since. <laughs> one idea. When you need a miracle, God will give you a plan. And it's going to be scriptural so that when you look at that plan, you know you have the divine right to it because it's in the Word of God. When He gives you that plan, if it's not in line with the Word, it's not from Him. And secondly, with that plan will come a set of instructions. God said to Joshua, you're the right man in the right place. Now here's the plan. March seven times. And on the seventh day, seven times. And blow trumpets and shout and the walls will fall down. But it wouldn't have happened. Not just the right place. Not just the right people. The right plan. God's plan for the family is one man with one woman. One dollar out of ten. I said one dollar out of ten is God's plan. One day out of seven is God's plan. Follow the plan and you'll get the miracles. God gave Noah a plan 
to save his family. Build an ark 300 cubits long, 150 cubits wide, 30 cubits high. Build it three stories high and put one window in the top and you would have appreciated that window if you'd have had all those animals on your boat and no other window. One window. Open the window, my God. Open the window. <laughs> Wedding of Cana, bring the pots, pour the water. I'll turn the water into wine, but here's a set of instructions. Here's a plan. Do you need a miracle? God has a plan. And I close with this thought, but Malachi 3, he said, prove me. For if you want to know I'm up here, throw me a seed and I'll throw you back a harvest. If you want to know if I'm real, I dare you, believer or unbeliever, begin to honor me with the tithe and the offering and see if I will not, listen to this, see if I will not open up the windows of heaven, which means you're either living under an open heaven or a closed heaven. Imagine every day, do you want, I want to ask you a question, do you this week want to live under a closed heaven? Heaven is shut up, closed. Or it's open, and the Bible said it happens according to how you obey the instructions concerning your giving. I don't want to go all week long with a closed heaven. I want an open heaven because it's not just money. I get peace. I get joy. I get instructions. I get kingdom connections. I get blessing people. I get, I get power relationships. I get all that God has for me when I'm under an open heaven. How many of you need a kingdom connection? How many of you need a power relationship? How many of you are lonely and you're ready for God's will? How many of you today need somebody to put you in where you've tried to get in and you can't get in? How many of you feel like God's saying break the plow? How many of you feel like the, the, the creek has dried up and God needs to give you a new set of instructions? You're in the right church today at all of our campuses and right here in Gainesville, I feel with great authority to tell you the right people are coming. God's going to put you in the right place. It's going to astound you. And he's going to give you a specific plan and set of instructions. If you follow it, he will bring his will to pass for this season in your life speedily. In Jesus' name. Uh, ben, my son-in-law, texts me, um, after the first service and they're, they're playing this in Orange County today and uh, he said you know the story you told about the maid of Naaman's maid he said uh, there's a guy in our church that comes out there some he's been attending pretty regular now on Sunday morning his name is Stephen Baldwin and he's a movie actor you've probably seen him in the movies and, and Stephen his testimony is and he's a very you know blessed and wealthy movie star and he had a maid, and she would sing in the kitchen. He said, we were lost, messed up, far from God. Said that his wife was the first, that the maid would sing hymns in the kitchen while she was cleaning. And one day his wife walked in there and said, what are you doing? And she said, I'm praising the Lord. And she said, I'm sorry, I don't need to do that, I won't do that. She said, no. She said, I love that. Please tell, and said she kept singing, and the woman, his wife got under conviction. And before, and a few days later, the woman got singing louder, and, and she got under conviction and broke and repented and got saved. And, and Stephen had been shooting a movie, and he came home, he came home, he came home, and could tell that something has happened in this house. Something has happened to my wife. Something has happened. And he said, you tell me. What are you doing? What are you doing? Who, have you met somebody? What's going on? What's going on? She said, I, I heard her singing. And she said, listen, listen. And said about that time she started singing again. And said all of a sudden conviction hit him. And the wife was crying. And he breaks down. And he said, we went in the kitchen and fell down on our knees and got saved. That's the right person, right place, right? You don't have to be a big shot. God can use you if you will be that person. He can use you. I want to be that person. Stand to your feet all over at every campus. Would you stand to your feet?
please don't move for just a moment. Lift your hands high, and you've got, you got 30 seconds to do nothing but praise God for the right people. Look back over your life. Look back over your life. There were power relationships that you wouldn't be where you are today had God not put the right person. And thank Him for the right places. And maybe the plow needs to be broke again. Maybe you're in a place where the brook is dried up. God has a new set of instructions, a plan. A plan, college student. A plan, sir. A plan if you just lost your last job. A plan. It's not over. You're not hearing this sermon by accident. God knows. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're in this room or watching at one of our campuses, if you're in the overflow of wherever you are, you would say, Pastor Jensen, I know that I'm far from God. I know that I'm not living right. I know that I'm not doing what I ought to be doing. I've got the wrong people. I'm in the wrong places. I've got the wrong plan. It's so obvious there's no peace in my life. I'd love to get a turnaround. I'd love to get a change. I'm going to tell you where it starts. It starts with the right choice. Make Jesus Lord of your life. If you'll make him the right choice, then you'll get the right people, the right place, and the right plan. But it starts with making him Lord of your life. Pastor, pray for me. I know I'm not right with God, but I want to get right with God. Pray for me. If that's you, everybody put your hands down. If that's you and you would say, Pastor, please pray for me. I need to get right with God. I want you to boldly, right where you're standing, lift your hand as high as you can get it. I want to see it all over this room. Hallelujah. My goodness, that's beautiful. All over this room, at every campus, lift that hand high. Every one of you that raised your hand, I'm going to give you a set of instructions now. This is the plan. I want you to get out of your seat as quick as you can and walk right down to the front of this building or wherever you are at any of our campuses. Just get right out and walk down. Come on. This is the, see, it's not enough to know you're in the right place and the right person that I'm talking to. Right now, obey this set of instructions. Slip out of that seat. Move out by faith. That's powerful. That's stepping out. That's breaking the plow. That's saying the old part of me needs to die. Come on, come on, they're coming, they're coming. Come on, young man. Come on, college student. Come on, come on, young lady. Come on, mom. Come on, businessman. Come on, this is your day. This is your service. This is your message. You know it's straight from heaven for your life. Don't waste another day of your life. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. We'll wait on you. Church clap for just a moment. I believe, I believe God is doing something pretty powerful right now. I sense it. I sense it. I'm going to lead you in a prayer in just a moment. This is so powerful. They're still coming. It's awesome, awesome, awesome. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. Father, we worship you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Holy Spirit. This is remarkable. They're still coming. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Just keep coming. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I tell you, next Sunday is critical that you hear this message. It's so important what I'm going to share tomorrow. It's taken me a lifetime to give you in, in, in 35, 40 minutes what's taken me a lifetime to learn next Sunday. And I don't want you to miss it. It'll change your life. Bless you, girls. That's awesome. It's awesome. It's awesome. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Everybody in this room, pray this prayer out loud. Say these words at every campus. Lord Jesus, I give you my life. I surrender to your will. Today begins the rest of my life. What you did on the cross when you shed your blood purchased my salvation. And I am forgiven. I make the choice. Jesus is my Lord. He is my Savior. He is my God. And today I praise you. Get the wrong people out. Put the right people in. Get me out of the wrong places and put me in the right places. I'm in the wrong plan, but today I step into the right plan. 
and I receive your will. You're going to orchestrate your plan for my life. I surrender all to you. Lord Jesus, I'm yours. And everybody who receives it, say amen. Don't forget, if you want to be a part of the miracle in Puerto Rico, please help us. We're going to get this offering to the people this week. It'll go to them. So help us if you can. Thank you so much.